G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Striker like Clayton here from XY Advisor. Just interviewed Chris Brikey of Stockspot. About four or five years ago, I guess it was, uh, when he first burst out on the scene with this term robo-advisor and a bunch of advisors sort of freaked out a bit. Uh, turns out that it wasn't sort of the be-all and end-all of financial advice. And what we've seen now is sort of very much a complimentary um, course. Not so much of a collision course, but a complimentary course. Um, I don't think... Anyone would suggest that uh, a robo-advisor will be taking over from where a financial planner could. And I don't think really financial planners have yet figured out a way to give advice to the masses. You know, only 16% of people get advice and 84% remain unadvised. So the market, the size of the market, the size of the opportunity for, uh, for Chris to sort of get, even if it's simple, financial advice into the hands of millions of Australians and and most advisors would see that as an attractive thing. So we cover how it started, we cover how, you know, he got involved with the chaser and a bunch of cool little things. So uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy. This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Launching nearly 20 years ago, this ASX-listed company is ranked number one for overall platform functionality and user satisfaction by investment trends for the past three years. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important now more than ever to embrace new technology and enhance the way you do business. With this change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives, and realize new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help you innovate in your business. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which clients should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Chris Bricky, mate, thank you so much for coming on the XY Podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome, man. So so you started a fraternity in Texas. I do want to know about this. That's true. So in my second year of uni, I decided to go over and study in uh, Texas. Now, I I chose that university. A lot of my friends were choosing the universities that had the best academic credentials. Yeah. Uh, with my marks, I, I couldn't quite get into those ones. So I, <laughs> I looked at different lists. I look at the at the top party schools in the US. Oh, um, tailgating, right? Yeah, Hell and yes. UT, University of Texas came up in, in a lot of those lists. Um, <laughs> so that, that was the uni I decided to study at. Uh, fortunately, it had a pretty good business school as well. So I, I learned a thing or two, but something we... we discovered pretty quickly in our time there was that we weren't getting invited to many frat parties and sorority parties. Um, Why? It it seemed to be, and and our impression was that the Aussie accent um, wasn't very popular with the American guys because it It was too popular. It it, it led to more competition than they would have liked. That Um, is so awesome. I love where this story is going. We basically got rejected from every frat party and, and, and because everyone was underage, nobody really went out. Um, in yeah, Austin, everyone was yeah, going to house course. parties and we felt a little bit left out. Yeah. Um, and, and there was probably half a dozen Aussies there on exchange. And so what we decided is we could con the Americans into believing that we actually were bringing an Aussie fraternity over from Australia. Yes! Uh, and and we, fortunately, <laughs> we had our own house there. So then we put all the signage out out front um, and, and we called it, you know, they all have sort of their Greek letters as their names, but it was Alpha Foster's Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had the, the big Greek letters out the front. Um, in the, if you can imagine the Foster's logo, um, <laughs> that is <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, and and somehow it caught on. So we, we had yeah, we had some amazing. It, it basically caught on with all the international students because yeah. none of them were getting invited to all of the American parties. So yeah. we we ended up having all of the international parties that then brought a lot of Americans in because obviously they were interested in all the the international boys and girls. Correct. Um, and, and yeah, we had, had a lot of fun with those. Uh, those parties oh. that we had there. But what was most amazing to me was I actually went to Texas a year later to visit some friends yeah. and I was out one night yeah. um, on 6th Street, which is the place that everyone goes there, and yeah. I noticed um, someone in a shirt with Alpha Foster's Alpha. No. Get out of town. And, and we hadn't even made shirts. <laughs> 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 and so I walked up to this bloke. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> like, where did that shirt come from? And, yeah. and he explained the story of how he'd found out about Alpha Foster's Alpha. <laughs> (laughs) And they decided to continue to the fraternity um, into a second year. So even though we had no communication with the the next year of exchange students, somehow they discovered the history of of our fraternity and continued it. Oh, my God. That is seriously one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Can we please reenact old school 
the movie and yeah. get it going again. <laughs> that is what it felt like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. starting over there. Is it? Is it? What? What is a frat like in the states? Is it literally standing there in your underpants and getting pushed off uh, I think balconies? So, thinking, so there's the hazing processes yeah, yeah. that you often hear about, and and they get in trouble for, especially at the preppy schools. But mm. it seems like the fraternity was almost like a little club that you join in your in your first or second year, and. Yeah, there was all sorts of factors that determined which club you joined. I guess what your parents were in, or I think religion played a part, right. or ethnicity. So yeah, everyone sort of right. found their even, little niche. Even ethnicity. Yeah. So there was like the black fraternity. Really? I can't remember what the Greeks yeah, were, right. and the Jewish fraternity. So <laughs> wow. yeah, it kind of segregated people. Unfortunately, yeah, it's a weird thing, isn't it? How that happens. Anyway, so um, so you 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 well, actually before you did any of that. Or was this after? Because we've presented at an event together before and, and during your, your introduction, it, it came out that you'd sort of done really well or won these ASX competitions. Was this pre or post Texas? That, the ASX competitions would have been well before. So they were school okay. competitions. So oh, that, right. the ASX used to run the, the, the stock market I think games. they still do the yeah, ASX yeah, yeah, yeah. school share market game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, early high achiever threw it all in for party life in Texas, right? Get that out of the system, come back to Australia. Um, and how much later was it that stock spot kicked off? Well, yeah, I wasn't throwing it all out. Coincidentally, <laughs> while, I was, while I was in Texas, I was still, um, and, and it was really uh, pretty um, reminiscent sure. of a bull market, but actually trading <laughs> stocks while I was over on Seriously? exchange, which, yeah, probably wasn't a smart thing to be doing. And I think I only sort of survived because <laughs> markets were, you know, in, in a very strong bull phase. Wow, this that's kind of This was in 2006. Cool. So, yeah, right. right. So, yeah, there was actually oh, yeah. trading going on within the fraternity. Man, yeah. that's super cool. So you traded your way through your own uh, your own fraternity it's, in Texas. Yeah, it's how I paid for my God, I've really my got drinking a, habit over there. <laughs> oh, I have to look at myself in the mirror. I'm nowhere near cool enough to do something like that. Funnily enough, Patty, Patty traveled the world trading um, gold, gold exchange, okay. gold futures. Yeah, for yeah. like two years, he, uh, he he traded them. Only gold futures. <laughs> Only gold futures. Um, he, yeah, gold bug. Worked out for him for a while. You know, a couple of years at least. It was, mm -hmm. it was good. I mean, what's it, his view at the moment? Uh, his view is don't trade gold futures. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think he, uh, he he's was. On, he's onto cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah. correct, correct. Uh, mate, so thank you for coming on. Uh, the founder of Stockspot sent a, a bullet up the advice industry back in 2013, back in 2014, probably more 2014 when, when we all started learning about it. And um, and all for naught, I, I largely thought. Um, uh, I don't think the advice industry should have been scared of quote unquote robo advice. Um, and as we've seen, it, it hasn't. I don't know. Maybe maybe you've got a different view of it, but I, I don't see people leaving their advisors. At least I don't see it. Maybe you probably do. But um, I'd, and that's a good question. Actually, I'd like to know. Um, how many of your clients have said they used to have a financial planner? Yeah, well, I, I mean, going back to your question, I, I don't think that um, you know, our business model or other similar models around the world are, are really going after sort of advised clients typically. Totally. <laughs> and so it seems like some people in the industry were concerned about that at the start. I mm. mean, I think... Mm. Uh, probably the younger advisors that have a different business model and, and, and their model wasn't only predicated on, you know, investment advice, you yeah. know, that they probably didn't worry as much, you know, but, yeah. but there were probably some older school, you know, more broker style Did advisors. Did you get any death threats? Um, no, we, I mean, we had lots of legal <laughs> threats from the banks in the early days because we published a lot of data on the performance of a lot of their funds. Was that the Fat Cat report? Yeah, so we, we published <laughs> this. Oh, you got legal. Published this report since 2013. <laughs> it's it's awesome. Wasn't too, this, yes, I've definitely fantastic. seen the Fat Cat report. It wasn't yes. very popular in, in some circles. Um, <laughs> and they offered some sort of legal repercussions. Oh, that was, awesome. it was soft legal threats. Yeah, that I, is. I wouldn't say. Yeah, no, no, no. And I completely <laughs> understand. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, man, that, that would make me run for the hills. What did you do? Well, I mean, we knew all our data was correct. And, yeah. And I mean, so, how can you get in trouble for uh, uh, publishing uh, data that's already public? Yeah. I mean, it was all information that, yeah. that, that, that they, you know, they had to publish. They didn't make it very easily accessible. And yeah, I think okay. they didn't like that we made it even more accessible to more people. <laughs> and, and we actually highlighted, you know, the performance <laughs> of a lot of these, um, you know, these products that yeah. weren't helping people. So Goodness. Um, Might have been the characters that put them out <laughs> off a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, we tried to have a, a little bit of fun. I mean, you, you guys know uh, super 
superannuation and, and managed funds isn't the most sexy topic for most people. Stop so it. We, we, Have you actually XY party at Dan Blazarian's house tonight? Well, yeah, you guys are changing that for the better. But generally for the average person, they're, they're not a lot of yeah. uh, excitement. So, yeah, we, I mean, we got the Chaser guys involved as well and they helped us create how a bit of a video. To, Do you know them or how did that come about? No, we, we got in touch through a friend actually and, awesome. and explained. I mean, they're so good at those types of, uh, yeah, yeah. those types of, uh, yeah, uh, you know, getting well, going after, yeah, satire, yeah, 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 going after sort of definitely you know, uh, the the fat cats in other industries yeah. and in other areas of life. Yeah. So we got them. I think this was the third year we run we ran that report to yeah. come with us and present some is trophies. No, this is on YouTube, so anyone can search it. Just ah. search the, the. I think it's the Fat Cat Fund Awards 2016, right. <laughs> um, where the the chaser it was uh, Charles Firth from the Chaser team. Nice. Um, came with us to present awards to the worst fund managers in Australia. Oh, and you actually um, went to them. We went to their offices. Yeah. We, <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we had giant trophies made up and huge novelty size checks. Um, a huge of, of how much, check, a check of the fees. Well, the check was how much they ripped off clients by. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we went in and, and presented it. Uh, we, we managed to convince security at a few of the places to let it, let us in a little way. Um, and but then they, they started to clue on and, and they weren't too interested in allowing us up to the, the upper levels. Oh, <laughs> But yeah, it was good fun. Did you get in front of anyone senior? Oh my god! No, I mean the security is pretty tight. Uh, so all of the fund managers that won awards were the big, uh, the big banks, yeah. um, and, and and one other, um, and and they weren't you know, organizations with low security. Let's put it that way. So yeah. we got to their lobbies and, and we lined up at reception <laughs> <laughs> with, a big trophy. with a with a with a big film crew and. <laughs> Uh, with a giant novelty size check and trophy. As soon as you and, see Julian and Morrow, you're like, we're in trouble. And, 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 and they would say to us, oh, no, no, we don't want this award. And, and Charles Firth was so quick with his response. And he, he was like, of course they will. They're shameless. They love awards. Like, <laughs> they'll definitely take it. And, and, and he held up the trophy and he said, look, they can fit some Dom Perignon in here with all the fees they've been taking. <laughs> And, I mean, coincidentally, it's, it's you know, it's closer to the truth than we would have thought. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, I saw some interesting uh, articles a couple of weeks ago around the, uh, the cash management account of one of the big banks and, and you know, mm. the, ha- how low the interest rate um, that that account's been paying relative to the salary of the executive that runs that business. And, and so... Yeah, often, yeah, true life is a little too close. <laughs> yeah, actually, there, there, there was, there's been some things come out recently um, from the Royal Commission, which always it interests me because they'll pick uh, things that I hadn't thought of, at least. So such as, uh, w- um, it's, it was one of the products, I can't remember which one, but it was a super account who was using the cash management account of the in-house mm-hmm. super fund, which... Then uh, the trustee got in trouble for not being the best interest duty because it was, you know, a decent amount of uh, basis points below. And I thought, actually, to be honest, my first thought, I I, I felt sorry for the bank. I felt sorry for the bank because as if, as if they're going to create a product and use a competitor. Like, I mean, think from a capitalist point of view, that's just not going to happen. What they should have done is, I don't think the argument is so much use bank B if you're bank A. It should just be your interest rate should be higher. But yeah. if you're a fiduciary and you have to act in the best interest of your Except, member, which is, yes, which which is, is by law what yes, super correct. funds have How, to do. Uh, yes, I <laughs> know. Well, yeah. I think, I mean, it highlights, I think, the biggest kind of issue that's come out of the Royal Commission, which is the issue of principal agent problems. So yeah. the problem where um, all sorts of um, you know, parties in the super fund industry, whether it's asset consultants or fund managers mm. or financial advisors, mm. in so many cases, their interests aren't aligned with the end member. Yes. I, I think right. from, from my personal point of view is that, and you may differ in this, my personal point of view is that finance runs pretty well in Australia. Like if you compare it to the rest of the world, it, do we have places to improve on? And I think that's a, that's one that we do need to improve on. So, for example, there are 219 or, or so RSE, Reportable Superannuation Entity Licenses, and 995 or whatever percent of them are owned by the big banks and by the industry super funds. And so literally – in uh, and so I just – I think I've got a simp- – I, I do have a sympathetic view of this a little bit because even though it's – it's written into law and you're 100% correct. And there's like, I just, I want to preface this by saying you're 100% correct. But the, the system as it currently is, is um, those 
RSE licenses are owned by these entities. And so while it's their job to hold that entity to account, they're just going to, the people that are actually doing it, right, the trustee, the people that are working in the trustee, I mean, they're just under intense social, professional, polite pressure to not treat them as if they're a third party, that the only way to fix this issue would be to not allow the entities themselves to own the licenses. That would be the only way. Because otherwise, let's say you're, let's say we both work for Bank A and you're the trustee and I'm the CEO of the business. I am consistently saying to you, hey, Chris, how about that trustee? Don't be too mean. That That is just happening. And, and I think to suggest any other is, is ridiculous. So would you, would you say that RSEs should not be owned by the banks and the industry super funds. I mean, I think there's other ways to solve the problem. And, and, and I agree with you to one extent. I think the the industry works fantastically if you work in the industry and are making money off the industry. <laughs> and it works disastrously <laughs> if you're a super fund well, member. And, and I'll give you some figures. So where, in the, where is a, better in the world? There's in, been no, everywhere, basically. So oh. there's been a, a fantastic study that's been done recently by a University of Sydney professor um, who looked at the performance of funds, and we do it every year in the Fat Cat Report as well, yes. relative to a, a synthetic benchmark of index funds. And he's looked mm. at this in all sorts of markets around the world to look at you know, the average pension funds in the UK, in the US, in, in, in other markets. And, and Australia, from his study, um, had the worst performance relative to benchmarks and the highest costs relative to benchmarks. I mean, I definitely um, and, and have to check that study. By, by his estimate, if um, from, 2000, or from 19, uh, 1996 <clears throat> to 2016, so over those 20 years, mm. if um, all of the superannuation was just invested in a low-cost index fund with appropriate risk and, mm. and the right cost structure, um, about $700 billion would be uh, – our fund, our system would be $700 billion larger, and that would be money in the pockets of super fund members rather than in – People working in the industry. I mean, I I, I I appreciate that's a high that's a high that's a high level sort of you know headline grabbing number, but there's so much there to consider. Well, okay, like, how, how much how much is is it the result of a quarter of the superannuation is currently in self managed super funds? So thirty percent of that is currently in cash. Like that's going to have a material effect. No, so on here's that here's another stat then. So and and this is one that we came up uh, we we've found in our Fat Cat report this year, which we haven't published yet, but mm. also it, it it actually mirrors studies that have been done in the UK. So we looked at a indexed balanced fund. So, and, and there have been indexed balanced funds that have existed, you know, Vanguard since uh, from 1992. So they've Are existed. Are you talking 70 30 balanced? Or yeah, 50, so 50, 50. Vanguard's is a 70 30 balanced yep, yep. And, and looked at equivalent balanced funds within superannuation. 70 30 so or? 70 30 within that sort of band, sure, you know, plus sure. or minus a few percent. So we looked at a like for like risk basis mm. um, and then adjusted the Vanguard fund for fees and taxes to mm -hmm. make it apples for apples. And this yeah. is a problem I see across the industry a lot of the ratings businesses don't really compare apples for apples. Mm. So yeah. if you do that properly, we found that only 4% of funds outperform the indexed option over the last five years alone. And it was even fewer over 10 or 15 years. Now, now is that, okay, is that a super fund? Is that, sorry, is that a, an index uh, Vanguard? Is that inside a super fund? So the fund itself isn't, but it was taxed and, and the fees were assumed to be within the side of super fund. So we okay, adjusted the fees it to are, make it like for like. So what, what kind of what kind of admin fees were you attributing to this bank? Uh, like equivalent to sort of regular admin fees. So looking at their index fund cost, which mm. I think at the moment is about 30 basis points, mm. um, plus a typical admin fee. Uh, yeah, a typical admin fee is now less than $100 a year. So it's not, not significant. Oh, so there was no percentage base built on top of that? Um, no. Oh, okay. So, well, well, in that case, then shouldn't it be measuring Vanguard plus a superannuation administration cost that is paid by these super funds? Well, not all super funds have a percentage based fee. A lot of the industry funds have just a dollar based admin fee. If you were so inclined to get that interested in. You're right. You're right. But well, not yeah, many people I'm happy use to talk it. about administration. So we just looked at all of the super funds in Australia. And, and do you want yeah. to guess how much we paid last year in, in administration fees alone? 
And, and you're, this is a system that you say is working fantastically and, yeah. and in the best interest of members. <laughs> no, I guess? never said it was acting in the best interest of members. So do you want to guess? Say is that it's, 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 that it's running pretty well. Do you want to guess what a system that's running pretty well charges yes. members in one year in administration fees? Uh, this is uh, administration, so not invest, okay, investment but, but fees. I These just are people know, I just doing the know, paperwork behind the scenes. I want to so. know the farm. How, what's, the, what's the size uh, of the farm? 1.6 trillion. So this is not trillion. SMSF. This yep. is just APRA regulated super. Not, not SMSF. Uh, uh, do we take the future fund? Do we take... Um... No, so that's not included. Okay. All right. So, so it's just regular, you know, uh, the, the biggest... Uh, okay, 1.6. Yeah, yeah. Give it... Yeah, it's because it's about a trillion in the in the government and, and, and trillion, SMSF. Yeah. It's 1.611 if you want the exact... Number. Okay. All right. So 1.611 <laughs> trillion. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go with administrative fees of a percent. A percent? So what's that? That would be... Don't, don't put Six, me on the spot 16 here. $16 billion? <laughs> uh, we pay $16 billion of administration fees. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when you say it like that, <laughs> it seems absurd. <laughs> That's like uh, doing the sums quickly, but that would be like over like $1,000 per member in administration fees. What sort of admin's going on? <laughs> yeah, look, it's a lot. But I mean, it's not it's not equally distributed across, obviously. But, it's, about, um, uh, it's about $5 billion a year. So okay. you weren't too far okay. off. Oh, right, right, right. But well, that seems, I mean, that seems appropriate. In my opinion. In what, yeah, okay, if you value... In what world is $5 billion of administration <laughs> fees appropriate? Okay, hear me out, hear me out. Because I'm thinking from a percentage point of view. So if it's only $5 billion and one point... Yeah, so it's about a third of a percent in administration ah. costs. But but that's another great question. Like, what is the relationship between assets and administration costs like? It's a very good point, considering it's very scalable. Yeah, you put forward a very good I mean, point. these are funds that a lot of them have now, you know, Australian supers, you know, 120, 150 billion pretty soon. Um, you know, a lot of the mm. other big funds are in the tens, if not hundreds of billions. Mm. What's shocked me is that they haven't become more efficient on the on the operational side. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've looked through the annual reports of a lot of these big industry funds and actually on a per member basis over the last 10 years, their costs of operations and administration have increased not decreased. Per member? So there's, yes, per member. So there's actually diseconomies of scale. And, and by our research, actually economies of scale cap out at about $5 billion of assets. Is that and, right? And above $5 billion of assets, we haven't seen any evidence that funds are actually getting economies of scale. If anything, they're getting diseconomies of scale. Why is that? Do you know? Would- do you suspect rather? Well, I mean, there's some great sort of news stories out there of, of money wasted on building administration businesses. So I think a lot of it comes to, you know, biz, uh, super funds, you know, in, in both sort of the industry and, and retail super world, um, deciding to do things themselves that they probably should have outsourced from the start. And, and who mm. knows why those decisions were made. But a few of the bigger industry funds a few years ago spent, I think, about a quarter of a billion dollars on, on a, building an administration business, which they basically sold for next to nothing because it was a huge failure. Mm. Um, so n- no one's really worked this out right. And actually, it's a, probably a great opportunity for you know technology to solve. And, and it's one we're trying to solve in our business is yeah. how can you make administration mm extremely efficient on a per member or a per client basis because it's something that's awesome, that, man. Yeah. you know, a, a th- a 0.3 of a percent of super every year. Remember, that's every year. So every 10 yeah. years, that's 3% of the whole money in the system yeah. is getting eroded for for what? Like operations? Well, like- actually, because I'm quite interested to ask where you think that money's going. So let's look at Australian super, for example. Uh, huge amounts of funds under management. Mm-hmm. You're saying that their cost per member has increased to serve. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're in a not-for-profit, mm-hmm. right, is it just the case that, well, we've got this money now and we're under obligation to spend it because we can't be profitable not, do you do you think it's something as simple as that? Not quite, but I think there's there's conflicts in all business models. So I don't think you know industry mm. funds are exempt from conflicts. Mm. You know, if you're an industry fund trustee, I believe you should be constantly looking at ways to essentially make your members' outcomes better. And 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 the evidence that we've seen suggests that lower costs is is the most powerful way of doing that. Mm. Um, but you've got to remember these are um, operations that employ a lot of people these days, and and so mm, yeah. for one of these businesses to actually make people redundant is difficult. It's kind but of an interesting. They also point employ like a lot a social of business, consultants yeah. and other um, other third parties. So just because they're you know to benefit members doesn't necessarily mean they're efficient, and it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that they're you know operationally working at, at the at the level that they should be. I want to go back to this five billion because. 
It's a lot of money, right? It, it, I, it's, I thought it was a small amount of money. Well, it's a small amount of money compared to the size of the pool that it comes from. But I think to your point is what value is being delivered on that $5 billion. I think that's probably more to your point. So I'm thinking, hey, a third of 1% is not too bad. Um, but you're saying, well, what, it, what what's being delivered on account like, of that? To put things in context, like if, if a third of 1% you know, might sound small to a lot of people, but um, a third of 1% compounded year after year after year, we, we found that um, you know, 1%, I mean, and, and it's a commonly cited figure, 1% compounded over your life um, in super for the average Australian, this isn't even a high income earner, for mm. a male will, will cost you about 250 grand and for a female it's slightly less mm. um, at the moment. But it's not an insignificant figure. Like, and, and uh, that's As a, the average... That's that's the difference in your final outcome, um, paying an extra percentage well, because, because Because the average, the average amount of a retiring male is about 250K. So... Uh, so what half? So this is looking at so an average um, thirty year old I think at the moment has uh, and the I think um, ABS has the figures a, a certain current balance and, and then we're looking at the average salary yeah. in Australia and saying okay nine and a half percent of that um, over the next you know however many years thirty five mm. years or so. Uh, um, okay, so you're, so you're talking more projection. I'm talking more the actual outcome. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I'm looking looking forward. If, sure. if you're in a fund charging one percent more than another you can fund, expect that in you the can future. expect okay. about a quarter of a million dollars less when you retire. Wow. Um, mm. And a third of percent, you know, m- might be a little less than a third of that. But yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's tens of thousands of dollars, um, if yeah. not hundreds. No, it's definitely okay. Question then: How 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 would Chris Bricky solve this? Uh, there's a few suggestions. So yep. w- w- I actually today submitted our uh, or I made our submission to the Royal Commission. So it's a lot of a lot of this is front of mind for me at the moment, mate. That's cool. Um, so so literally, they're taking submissions on how to fix things. Well, taking sub, uh, public submissions based on what's come out so far, and, and I mean, and this is in, in all parts of the Royal Commission, but superannuation yes. is the area we're focused on. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're taking public submissions. Mm. You know, you have to sort of reference what's going on. You can't just talk about you know something completely unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> I started a fraternity in two thousand and six. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that, that might entertain them, there, but I think they're probably focused on uh, other things at the moment. Correct. Yeah. Probably have a beer with them to discuss that later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Are you able to open the bonnet? As yeah. yeah, look, I, I mean, I think generally, and, and I guess this goes counter to what you're saying, I, I think the system just doesn't work. Really? Like, it, it's a terrible system at the moment, particularly the default system. So you know, when people make choice, you know, then I think it's a different, you know, it's a different kettle of fish. And, mm. and when people make choice, the responsibility falls a bit more towards the person making that choice. Mm. Um, but most of the money in Australia isn't in choice super. You know, even though I guess yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. people like us might assume that a lot of people are making choice. Like no, but most, most people, people don't. aren't making choice. Hundred um, percent. It's in, it's in default funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there are fantastic default funds out there. Yes. But there are also terrible default funds out there. And, and based on the yeah. research we've done, um, unfortunately, like even people having access to more information about what makes a good fund or or not. I mean, we we publish the Fat Cat Report every year. We make a big mm. fuss of it. Mm. We name and shame the worst funds. But what we've seen is a lot of the worst <laughs> funds get more and more assets every year. <laughs> Um, so it's a, it's Everyone's a broken... like, fuck you, Chris. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine any other category where like it, yeah. there is... The Razzies. Essentially, it's the Razzies, right? The Razzies of movies. So, oh, so yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's like when Catwoman or Halle Berry got the Razzie for the worst actress ever. And then, and then afterwards, uh, sales to... To Catwoman would spy. Well, yeah, I mean, at least movies is a bit, you know, it's a bit objective. (laughs) I've got to find out how bad this is (laughs) invest. (laughs) But there aren't many other categories in life where you can sort of empirically say these are the worst products, and yet those products survive and they flourish. Um, To me, this sort of suggests we're we're in a broken system. When you say worst, how do you you, you qualify that? Because it is a performance? Well, so again, so we look at funds in a equivalent risk category. So we only look at funds with a similar level of like growth and defensive assets over set periods of time. Now, I think one and three year performance is pretty irrelevant because mm. there's so many random factors that For come sure. into play. Yes. Uh, ideally, you want to look at funds over sort of 10 years plus because then yep. you get to see through a, a full market cycle. You know, yeah. you know Lehman's went bust just mm. about 10 years ago this week. So Whoa. you're now missing that part of the cycle, but yeah. at least you get some sort of idea. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our methodology is to look at funds on a like-for-like risk basis, um, look at their after fee returns. 
Um, and then we've done a lot of analysis around, you know, do the fees of a fund give you much, um, you know, information around how they're likely to perform? And, and the answer is like, clearly, yes, like yeah, a, yeah, a yeah. huge amount of information. Yeah. So the percentage of of funds charging, um, let's say one and a half percent plus, yeah. um, that are in our sort of worst, you know, worst list, you know, the bottom, the bottom quartile, yes. um, it is astronomically higher than the funds that charge half a percent per year that mm. are in that worst list. S and P do a really interesting uh, scorecard called the Spiva scorecard, and they talk about survivorship of the top performing funds, Ooh. Uh, which which is really interesting. So if you if you look at the survivorship of the top performing funds over five to ten year periods, it's less than what like it's 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 statistically irrelevant it's like if you can if you can pick a winner today then that's okay but you know you'd be unlikely to be able to do that statistically speaking but to be able to consistently do it every single year is near on impossible so i'm keen to learn then if you're kind of looking at longer term projections and the spiva scorecard is saying the top performance is going like this (laughs) what do you do with that information because it's kind of like what i'm looking at now in terms of a league table you pick the bottom one well, well, yeah. So, uh, the, I mean, the the S and P the the Spiva, um, yeah, report card is a great one, and uh, they just came out with their latest one, I think, a week or two ago. There, that mid year one, and and that basically showed that over fifteen years in Australia, eighty one percent of active funds underperformed an equivalent index. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, and that's actually quite good compared to internationally, mm. where it's about ninety percent, um, oh. or in um, fixed income, where it's also you know in the high eighties. So. Um, I mean, what they basically say in their report, which is very consistent with what we see, is that the winners change year in, year on, year out. So they might have been fortunate with an asset tilt or been lucky with a fund manager. Um, you actually need a lot of data to see whether a fund manager is outperforming because of skill rather than luck. Um, that The statistics actually are that you need... Um, 22 years of performance data to know whether a fund manager has outperformed due to skill rather than luck with a 90% probability. Um, so, you know, it, there's a lot of, you know, quite well-known fund managers in Australia that have been around five or 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, some of them have outperformed, some haven't. What I would say is that is still pretty unconclusive as to whether, yeah. you know, the, the um, outperformance is due to something that is repeatable mm. over longer periods of time. Problem, you- I guess, for the fund manager is you'd get sacked 19 times in that 20 odd years. <clears throat> If you even if you were well, yes, yeah, so, and the that's the other sure. interesting fact is a lot of the best performing funds, that very tiny group that are able to perform, they have huge periods of underperformance because in order to be in that top echelon, you actually have to have views, and often those <laughs> views are wrong for a long period of yeah, time because they're long term. And so, what what I think I'm not sure if it's a Spiva study, but other studies have found is that small, um, you know, few percent that end up being consistently good performers. Yeah. At some point in all of their lives, they're in the worst quartile, and they yeah. almost have to be because you know. If you're actually going to take a view, you're not always going to be well, right. High you're only going to be means, right over yeah, the long term. High volatility, right? What, yeah. One interesting uh, study, I, I read a uh, an article on, I think it was the Canadian pension system, and they're like one of the best performing pension systems around the world. Their system's totally different. When you work in Canada, you actually don't get to choose your pension uh, policy at all. It has to go into this one fund. And that means redemptions for this one fund are, are guaranteed, right? Because you know... Uh, Clayton joins today and he doesn't meet it at a condition of release until so I know that I've got his money up mm-hmm. until that time so what that's lent itself to is their largest asset class in in that pool is uh, unlisted unlisted assets mm-hmm. because they can take such a long view on on their investments they know exactly when the redemptions are coming out and it's exactly what you're talking about they've got that benefit of you know 20 plus years because you don't have a choice as a Canadian. That money is locked in Well, yeah, I think they describe that as the liquidity premium, which we know exists in fixed income, and and it's sort of debatable in other asset classes. But, Mm. yeah, the the Canadian pension system and other sovereign funds are are using that. Mm. A lot of the Australian funds are doing the same. Um, The only difference is that... You know, there's no reason why a lot of people can't redeem out of an Australian fund yeah. uh, at one point, in, in which case there's actually a lot of risk in these funds if they're in illiquid, unlisted assets, because you know, they can essentially be a run on the fund and they can't actually meet their liabilities. Um, I, I think that's something that hasn't really been looked into in a lot of detail mm. in Australia. It's and, an interesting thought, isn't it? Just um, like if you didn't have to have any liquidity, what does that... What, 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 well, what it would, it, yeah, it would change how you invest. And, and I mean, I know it's an extreme sort of idea, and I did hear you interview a guest you know, recently 
recently where I think his idea was that really for Volt Super, um, you know, competition hasn't worked in Australia and, and not having competition would be mm. an idea. Um, I don't disagree with him. I, I think that's either an option or um, some sort of system that actually creates price tension. So, you know, what we know is even with um, my super, there hasn't been enough price competition to actually drive prices down to the point where it actually is affecting member member outcomes as it should. So we've seen, you know, fees maybe fall from 1.3% to 1.1%. Now, if you have a look at equivalent pension systems in, in you know, Canada, the, the, the US, you know, Chile is another great example, New Zealand even, um, the costs are closer to 0.3 to 0.5 per year. So wow, we're that's still, low. you know, compared to other countries, at least double the cost. Yeah. And that's, that's our admin fee. There isn't. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, these businesses in admin are Don't make me defend up. that admin fee. <laughs> <laughs> but administration's a lot easier if there's one business looking Bang after on. it and, and not 50 million different admin businesses. So. There, I... I I, yeah, are you talking about the Houlihan uh, interview? Yeah. Yeah, so that was a really good point. So I think if you go back, and I can't remember when it was, but when it was either Commonwealth Bank or it was one of the banks, I think it might have been Commonwealth Bank before it was demutualized, it set the reserve rate dictated by the government. And so every other, every other bank around it didn't have to stick to it, but there was at least a baseline. And of course, it being the government, it was, it was, there was no premium there, right? Since that time, we've seen an insane gap grow between what is the reserve rate and the current interest rate. And so I guess while... What's the reserve rate now? As in, what is that measured by? Or is that the, the, cash the rate? mortgage rate or like BBSW or... Yes. Yeah, so the difference between uh, the, the the government set rate and then what the banks are charging. Am I just explaining? For it loans wrong? or yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. For a mortgage, that's their, their interest margin. <laughs> well, uh, yes, but they're it's grown a lot. Mm. Like the, the, that margin is has blown true, yeah. out, right? That's so why they're the most profitable banks in the world. <laughs> hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> which we all which we all own in our super. Uh, which is always the funny uh, counter argument, isn't it? Oh you you're getting some of the money, Mac. Don't worry, mate. Anyway, um so uh, <laughs> it's a very strange circular <laughs> argument that one. I've never quite worked yeah. it out. <laughs> Pay a dollar in fee and get six cents back. Yeah. What's up, brother? Um, Rip yourself off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, you're brutal. Um, so what I was going to uh, align that, that argument to before is uh, while I, I could never, like, the libertarian in me would never in a million years agree to having a Canadian system where all of our money is just kept in a government mm. controlled and you have no freedom it's scary, to do it. It's scary, isn't it? It's yeah. massively scary because all it takes is a Pol Pot or a fucking crazy dictator to come in. Excellent. I have all your cash and you can do nothing about it. Not that there's a high chance of that happening, but it is that uh, the, the, there's a risk that... But it's not like this is a new thing. Like it's happening and happening in, in a lot of countries and they're doing a lot better than us. Um, no, totally. And, and also this isn't money that it's like our, our money that we've sort of you know saved up. I mean, this is a government regulated pool of money that the mm. government's created um, for only the benefit of retirement. Like, no, it is, it's, it's written, our money. It's written into legislation. It's definitely that the only, our money. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not a bad point. Though. It, it is, is our it money. Is, it is, a, it is a Centrelink proxy. Like it's, it's, it is our money, but it's, it's not a, really our money. It's it, just, it, it's it just, is our money look, to it, suggest otherwise is crazy. Yeah, so it's a um, defined contribution scheme rather than defined benefit. So it is money that is ours. Absolutely. You know, however, the purpose of that money as written into law the, is the, only um, for the purpose of uh, retirement. <laughs> Yeah, and ancillary to pay for insurances. And for insurances, yeah. yeah <laughs> Which is always apparently. my favourite thing. This is the sole purpose, plus this extra but, I mean, additional I mean, one. The, it's the like, concept, why call it the sole? Call the, it one of The two. concept of insurance relates, it, it <laughs> relates one of to two, retirement as well, one right? One of like, two purpose that should be renamed. Sorry, I'm carrying on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> um, so where I was going to before was um, on with the Canadian system. I'd be happy to have a, a, a government, one that's run by the government, as long as there was choice as well. So I think that was Houlihan's argument originally. And, and what do you want choice around, like the risk that they're taking? Investment choice. Like the investments that they're making. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I can kind of understand that from our perspective, we work in the industry, but for the average Australian out there, I, I think 
what and so actually I, I agree with you. I think there should be choice. I Absolutely. think people should be out of choice. Yes. And if you have choice, you don't need to necessarily invest in the government scheme with choice. So yes. all I'm talking about is default that people for people that yeah. don't want choice. It's a, it's an interesting yeah. argument. Yeah, which was which was and, um which was Michael's and argument. And so my argument is for people that don't want choice, mm. um the you know, people that are defaulting into super, yeah. then you know, whether it's a government entity or whether there's some sort of um, you know, auction system that actually leads mm. to a better price discovery around what yeah. the real price is. Um, you know, either one of those, I think, is a much better option than what we're currently doing. And and I think actually a better option than what the Productivity Commission recommended, which is this really? sort of top, top 10 list. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of flaws that would wow. be seen in that, in you, that sort you, of... You, so you'd want to see it go down to one? Well, the problem with the top 10 list is, um, first of all, it, it brings in all the sorts of like politics and, and, and you know, all the mm. sorts of problems that already exist. Like, yes. you know, we know from our report that the big banks and AMP by far have the worst funds, but there's no doubt that, you know, at least one or if not a few of those would be represented in that group, even though they absolutely, absolutely don't deserve to be. <laughs> um, but that's just the politics of it. Right. But more than that, I mean, what we see is the top 10 list one year um, you know, changes and it changes through the cycle because yeah, um, funds that have a tilt towards a certain asset class that does well for a few years tend to look good. Yes. Then they get inflows. And we know this across, you know, investing around the whole world. But actually, if inflows are actually a, a predictor of underperformance, not outperformance. And so what happens is funds move up the list. People see that they've done well. They put their money into them. And then those funds tend to underperform unless unless actually the benefit um, that they have is actually a cost benefit rather than just a lucky asset tilt or, you know, they selected a fund manager that did well for a while. So mm, what I think would happen would would be that um, the 10 funds that would be selected would be ones with good recent history. Um, however, that good recent history wouldn't translate into good future returns. Man. So you're you're a big believer in the in, in um, modern portfolio theory, obviously. Yep. Uh, Ray represents a, a financial planning um, company that has on its side uh, an additional um, investment company as well, right? Yep. Yep. Can you explain the small difference between just normal passive and then the the tilt that you guys use it as in uh, trading that passive? Yeah, so our our thing is um, being dynamic at asset allocation level. So rather than banging on about whether or not CBA is better than, than NAB, we, we would prefer to have the conversation a level higher to say, let's have a look at the financial sector and understand whether or not that's attractive or unattractive relative to... Uh, alternatives at a, at a kind of equal weighted risk calculation. So start at the cash rate, whatever the cash rate pays, let's say it's 2%, have a look at all the various uh, various assets, and then you, you understand what the future forecast return looks like to understand if there is a premium that justifies taking that amount of risk. Now, if there if there is, then then you, you, you do it, albeit to different levels depending on people's risk profiles, and then you just balance it on an ongoing basis. But it's at asset allocation level, so you, you're actually not getting bogged down in the, the stock-specific stuff. So it's just a portfolio of ETFs, basically, and I've kind of explained it in a really complicated way. But it's 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 a risk-balanced ETF portfolio that tries to beat cash based on the amount of risk that it takes. What do you think about that, Chris? Well, yeah, so first of all, I'm a big fan of modern portfolio theory, but with a big caveat that, like, Actually, managing people's behaviour, I believe, is way more important. Totally. Um, and and people's behaviour and biases, I think, um, you know, from an advice perspective, you know, is something that advisors need to think about a lot more than what the asset allocation is. Yeah. Uh, you know, Markowitz, who came up with portfolio theory, he's been widely cited and, and he's announced um, in terms of his own portfolio, he only puts 50% in shares and 50% in bonds. And this is the guy that came up with the crazy formula of working out um, you know, the, the sort of optimal allocation. And even for his own personal allocation, he's decided 50-50 um, is better because he thinks that's the level that will actually minimise his regret. You know, if, if markets go up, um, you know, he won't regret not having something there. And if markets fall, he won't regret having everything in there. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, behaviour is just as important as actually sort of those base allocations. Yeah. You know, that, that's sort of one side. I mean, on sort of taking active decisions, whether it's sort of asset tilts or, you know, stock selection or in any sort of area, I mean, I always go back to my training as a trader. So I, I used to be a trader and mm. trade stocks and um, the people that I sort of learnt from, like my mentors, um, before I did any trade, they would ask me one question. And that question was, what is your edge? 
what is your edge over everyone else out there, all the thousands of others of fund managers and analysts that are crunching the numbers and, and, and trying to understand what to buy and what to sell? And if you don't think you have some sort of informational edge that everyone else doesn't have, don't trade. Don't make an active decision. Um, and and, and that's, that's what I go back to every time. Um, you know, I, I question whether I should be making an active decision or whether our client should be making an active decision is what edge do you have? And is that an edge that... Um, you know, is defensible that others don't have? Is it an informational edge? Do you have information that others have? Is it a timing edge? You know, are you getting in earlier than others? Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's a good question for anyone that's sort of looking to trade or pick stocks or, or make any sort of active decisions in their portfolio needs to think about, um, you know, whether, you know, I mean, the markets at the moment, are at their all time highs. And, and I think um, a lot of investors out there probably are thinking that's great. I'm going to lock in some profits. The market's high. Um, it, what's actually been shown is at all time highs, um, there's a huge tendency for retail investors because of that anchoring bias to be offloading stock. But actually all time highs is um, historically a good time to be buying. Um, <laughs> and so it's actually a bias that people are, are, are falling into selling at all time highs. Yeah, wow. um, but if they ask themselves, what is my edge? They'd realize, well, wait a second. I mean, I'm only selling because the price is high, but you know, why why am i even doing that like what extra information do i have that tells me that just cuz just cuz the market's high now doesn't mean it's not going to go higher so yeah, yeah 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 i think i think edge is a great question to ask yourself because if you don't have an advantage over the millions of others out there you yeah. know remember information is disseminated so quickly these days in markets you know we've got the internet you know yeah. bloomberg like thousands of fund managers that are pouring over information you know, on, you know, in infinitesimally small time horizons, um, if you don't have sort of extra information that other people don't have, um, it it's very hard to beat the market. Yeah, man. A lot of what you say makes a lot of sense. I was uh, sitting in the uh, reception area to get my teeth looked at earlier today. And as I was sitting there, I don't have, um, I don't have the TV at my house. Like I have a TV, but it's only plugged into YouTube, right? That's, that's all I watch. So, um, so it was daytime TV or whatever it is, right? So I'm sitting there and and on comes this, what's it called? Infomercial. It was a live infomercial, a live read, right? Mm. Sham wow. The, to, that, to the equivalent of, right? And it was this guy and you could see his eyes reading the script, right? He's pretending to look at the camera, but he's like clearly reading the script and, he, and he's, he's speaking like this. Hi, guys. Just so you know, we've got this product. Anyone can become a trader. And I, I, I said, what? And he, then he went on to talk about grandpas and grandmas who were watching the TV show can sign up to his course, read his book, and then build the life of their dreams. I think, I think his book was seven Seven minutes of work a day, or something to that extent. You got that from so something about Mary. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm making a book. Six minutes of work a day, and, and and I had such an emotional disgust to what was going on that as I left, so I'm sitting there waiting to go to the dentist, and I come out of the dentist. Great teeth, by the way. Great teeth. Looking good. Yep. Thanks, mate. Um, clean bill of health, and then uh, uh, the receptionist says to me. You really weren't enjoying what was on the TV before, were you? I said, "Oh, was I showing that?" She was like, "Yeah, you were shaking your head." And I was like, "Yeah, because..." And and I and I sort of went on a bit of a rant. And I said, "It's because you got some retired people at home watching this TV, and this guy is selling them a product that ninety nine point five percent of people." fail to achieve, which is yeah. to successfully day trade. Mm. I'm thinking, what? How? dare this guy be able to do this in the middle of a royal commission and literally with that amount of passion the receptionist behind the dentist said you could see the look on her face like i shouldn't have asked <laughs> i mean it's, it's such a great um story because i think like it, it's one of the big problems with the industry but more with people's behavior is people don't want the slow way to riches like they yeah. they yeah. want the quick way there and, and unfortunately there is no quick way there but there's a lot of people out there that will tell you there's a quick way there yeah and, and like uh, you know from working in this industry you know as long as you guys like you, you see so many spivs that are selling some, you know, magical system. Some I can't believe I some, can't believe they can get away with it. Um, and, and I mean, again, a question I would suggest anyone that's considering one of these things should be asking themselves: if is if that system is so good or that newsletter is so good, why aren't they doing it for themselves? Why are they sharing it with me? Correct. And it's the same I think in the industry for a lot of questions is you know if there's a new product being offered to you, um, most great products and most great fund managers 
out there don't need to ask people for money. You know, they've closed up their funds because they're so good. Absolutely. You know, that they can charge whatever they want. They can have whoever they want as clients. They don't need to ask. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're looking for someone to beat the market, um, they don't want your money. Yeah. <laughs> Those people, and there, there is a few of them out there, they don't want your money. Um, the people that do want your money is the people that have a system that doesn't work. And, and they want to make money from selling you the system. They want to sell you the shovel, not the gold. Well, and so if I, if I, look, at, if I look at a, a situation where we've got 0.3% is being charged by admin to the tune of, of $5 billion a year, I, I'm far like the segue le- back to well, well I'm far less annoyed about that because it's a third of one percent of someone's wealth although it is compounding and I and I totally get your point but if we're gonna do something about that we have to do something about this charlatan selling a course that's going to cost someone 70 percent of their wealth in a weekend yeah I mean I, I don't disagree and I think that there are so many poor products out there that people yeah that people will buy. I mean, I, I think there's a bit of a difference. I mean, probably $5 billion worth of money isn't going into that trading system. So, you know, from a dollar perspective, even though, you know, it, it's clearly a lot dodgier than the 3%. Yeah, it's a bigger effect. From a dollar effect. value, it's probably having less impact on the economy. It's on the um, economy, sure, and but on, to those individuals, and on retirement it's balances. Have, but it, yeah, it will yeah. have a big impact on those individuals. I think, yeah. you know, the, the laws, um, you know, the laws around advertising financial products try to address that in some way about, you know, talking talking about past performance, what you're allowed to do or not. But yeah, I agree. Like so many businesses if get around them. something's a service, and, it, you know, if this guy is just saying, I've got a book and a system. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's no a few rules. famous examples no I remember from a, yeah, a certain business news channel of, of people that are constantly on their advertising, you know, their brokerage service or their, you know, yeah. their, their tipping newsletter that I have the same feelings of you. I mean, I don't, you know, th- throughout the day, I used to watch that channel when I, you know, worked, you know, in a bank because they had the TVs on all the time. But yeah, so, m- so many of those ads frustrated me and angered me because mm. I-, I felt the same way as you. There's all these, you know, m- you know, people at home watching this, you know, um, you know, believing the promises oh, and believing man. the dream. And, <laughs> and it was so bad. It, I think it comes back down to as well. Like I, I truly believe like having, you know, sort of traded and worked in the industry that the only way people learn sadly in financial services is by losing money. And, and there is nothing so far in my career that has kind of convinced me otherwise. You know, people, you know, whether it's, you know, wanting to trade stocks or whether, you know, wanting to, you know, buy a system like that or a newsletter, the only way people will realize themselves that it doesn't work is by losing money. It's an <laughs> and unfortunate it's, it, it's so sad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a hard, I mean, I probably had to go through the same process mm. in, in my career is you, you test everything out to see if it will work and, and you want to believe different things work. <laughs> um, but when you lose money, you realize, well, wait a second, there's, there's got to be a, you know, that's clearly not the way. I know. I, lo- I, I think one of the most valuable things that advisors do is stop people making those decisions. Like mm. uh, mates of mine who have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on specky stocks. And I just, I, I begged them. And I think that's why, you know, the crowdfunding laws that have come out recently, that's why they limited the amount you can invest in a crowdfunding yeah. investment because they thought, okay, we'll let people gamble, yeah. but let's not gamble, let them gamble too much. And I yeah. think conceptually it's the same yes. around the laws that they were, were tr- uh, some people were trying to pass through on pokies. So, you know, conceptually people should be allowed to gamble. Our society's decided that. But should they be able to put through $100 bills through a machine? Yeah. You know, the quantum of how much they're able to gamble is kind of the question. And, and so, yeah. you know, I, I think, it, you know, it would be sensible to have a limit of how much your bet size could be because that limits how much people can lose. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't mean they can't lose money and it doesn't mean they can't lose money every day if they don't want, but it kind of limits the harm. Um, so what, what's the biggest one press bet you've ever made? Uh, I don't think I've ever used a pokey. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? The, the stock market was my pokey machine as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a pokey player? No, no, no. <laughs> I, th- I, 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 it's a miserable amount. It's like $5 oh, and I'll yeah. never forget. I was like, boom. Can oh, you go yeah. higher than $5? I don't know. I've a pokey machine for a while. But I, yeah. Yeah. The most dangerous thing, and, and I saw it. So when I was... 18 and, and my friends are 18, you know, as you do, you go to the casino because that's mm. one of the places you can go when you're 18. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. And, and I went with my friend, you know, when we were both turning 18. And, and I think actually it's it's kind of led to big differences in our lives since then. So th- oh, this, this, no. this, like, I think it actually changes your psyche. So Whoa. I think when the first time you gamble, you lose money, mm. um, your psyche changes immeasurably for the rest of your life versus if you gamble for the first time and you make money. Now, I went to the casino and lost my $50 or whatever it was. And I've never, never gambled at a casino since, or maybe, maybe once when I visited Vegas, but a small amount. Um, yeah, I think 
uh, if someone else going through that same experience, if you make money in the first time that you gamble, the kind of emotional high that you get and those feelings that you get and that confidence that you get um, yeah. really affects you. And I think actually the best thing for people when they, they're gambling or you know, doing anything around sort of speculation is to lose money younger and earlier and when they have less money so they learn those lessons on a smaller dollar amount. <laughs> well, so if you go back to when I was 18 and I did the same thing and I was flat broke. But I'd heard that if you sign up at the casino, you get a ten dollar. Oh, that's free true. That's chip. why we went as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I a, went there. What a great strategy for them, and such yeah. an unethical strategy <laughs> generally. Oh, and you get free <laughs> membership. Right, yeah. <laughs> I took that ten bucks, and and I uh, turned it into like eighty bucks, and I was able to buy you know a couple of drinks for my buddies. But I walked out thinking I'd taken the house. Yeah, like, I was just like, yeah, That is extremely good discipline and you're not a, a sort of customer they want. <laughs> yeah, I know. They'll you would not have been invited back. <laughs> $80 every time. Yeah. Like this guy has way too much willpower. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he didn't double up again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mate. Um, so are you moving into advice land? Is that something you want to do? We've always provided advice, so I, I don't know mm. how much people know about our, our business model, but you know something I thought that um, you know we should do from the start, and not all online investment services do, is actually provide personal advice. So mm. we're, we're actually regulated as a personal advice provider. Yeah, right. And we give each client a statement of advice, which we, we review at least annually and, and wow. update based on people's circumstances changing. Yep. So. I mean, we see ourselves as a, a, an advisor, mm. not around everything. I mean, sure. we, we explain to clients and we, we're pretty clear in scoping that we're only providing advice around a small part of, you know, a small part of their lives. So we're not looking at their insurance or their estate planning. And, you know, th these are probably areas that, you know, we're not, not going to be focused on because I don't think they're areas that, um, you know, at the moment we've got any sort of, you know, advantage, I guess, yep. for, or, or I think we can add sort of extra value. Um, but, you know, we, we decided we wanted to provide personal advice around investing, yep. um, which we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we are providing advice all the time. We're doing it in a slightly different format than, you know, traditional advice. I do guess you partner with, uh, with, exist with other advisors? So if another advisor wants to use your product, do you issue an SOA and the advisor issues an SOA or, or, or do you just allow the advisor to issue the SOA? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a bit of a work in progress. And, yep. and, and I think advisors kind of have a, a system that they use in terms of providing advice. And so integrating with that, um, you know, ha has been a bit of a challenge, like working sure. out how, how that works. Yeah. Um, you know, there are businesses out there that just sort of solely do sort of automated statement of, statements yes. of advice, obviously, yep. for advisors. Um, or there's sort of services out there that kind of white label that process. Yep. Um, I mean, the challenge for us is that um, because we are sort of regulated as an advisor, we legally have to provide that statement of advice to clients. Interesting. Um, so where we've worked with advisors, it's typically you know, not sort of integrated into their software, but as a referral. And then we give the advisor access to view all of their clients in a sort of dashboard that we've built for advisors. Awesome. Um, so the clients will still interact with us and we'll email the clients with, you know, updates around how their portfolio is going and, you know, you know, keeping them on the right path and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So we'll provide advice around that part. Yep. And, and the advisor will still provide advice around, you know, insurance or, you know, it, it might be sort of strategic advice or other types of advice. Yep. Um, and, super, and so, super keen to learn because, uh, you know, one of the things you spoke about was the behavioral thing. And, and, you know, one of the things that we're focused on in our work is is shifting the investment conversation to the side and really focusing on, on managing the person and their mm -hmm. emotions. And, you know, one of the, the struggles for us is is how working out how to do that in a way where it's scalable and commercial and all those sorts of things. And clearly technology is a way to do that. Have you have you sort of thought about how your business can integrate managing the person and, and the behavioral stuff into into that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something we think is extremely important. And, and we yeah. we see it. We have the data of how many people log in when markets are falling versus <laughs> how many people log in when markets aren't falling. Yeah, so, well. you know, we see firsthand the nerves mm. and we see firsthand all of those biases that sort of lead people on their own to not invest well. And so I, I definitely think, you know, whether it's our type of advice business or a you know, face to face advice business, there is certainly a role for advice when it comes to investing. And, you know, there are people out there that say, oh, no, I can and do it myself. And, and I think we've actually got a lot of those clients who thought that they could do it themselves. But then, you know, that they fell for some of those temptations that, you know, they're constantly sort of in people's faces to, 
you know, to, to be more active or to, you know, pay, you know, more fees for something else or to tweak their portfolio too often. So the temptations out there for people make it, um, you know, that, that's what creates the opportunity for advisors to really yeah. kind of be a handholder and, and to keep people on the right track. Um, yeah, but to answer your question, um, yeah, we're slowly personalizing the experience more. So when we started, we kind of had a, a one size fits all process. But as we get more data and learnings, we can start to segment clients into kind of client groups, mm -hmm. um, you know, based on all sorts of different attributes. So it could be, you know, where, how often you log in or, you know, how often you top up or and, and all of these attributes help you kind of understand their behavior now, you know, what it's likely to be in the future what their potential sort of, you know, problems might be in the future and, and yep. try and be a bit proactive about and addressing them. So the proactiveness, does that does that work in, in the way of uh, providing prompts to these people to say, hey, guys, we've just noticed that you've checked in five times more than, than you usually do, or is it, what is that? Not that, of... not that directly. Um, so, I mean, an, an example is... So, for instance, when you know markets have a, a pullback, so when markets fall five or ten percent, and I think since we've existed in to, since two thousand and fourteen, there's been you know one twenty percent pullback in markets and and a couple more ten percent pullbacks. Um, so they're, they're kind of they've been good learning examples for us. Um, what we've seen from those is that. Um, clients fit into a few different buckets. One of the bucket that, especially first-time investors, people that have never invested before, that's a whole new experience for them. That they're used to either a cash account that goes up gradually and, and never has drawdowns, or you know they're definitely not used to seeing um, you know ten or twenty percent of their capital you know, disappear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so those ones we find need a, a little bit more handholding, and 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 you need to be a bit more proactive with. Um, and, and we we write a lot of content and blogs to explain around what's going on in the world. You know, I think a few years ago it was, you know, Greece originally was one yeah. of the sort of stories out there. So, right. yeah. you know, explaining to people not only what's happening, but also that, you know, the markets are well ahead of this and, and that um, reacting to markets, you know, again, you don't really have any edge in reacting to markets. So there's no, yeah. it's a hard thing to explain to people, but, you know, the information's already in the market. So you acting is not a smart thing to do. Um, and then, you know, on, on, on the other side, there's also clients that are very experienced clients that have told us when they've, you know, when they've signed up with us, oh, I've invested for, you know, 20 years now, I've already been through, you know, you know the 2008 financial crisis. Some great clients... question to ask though, isn't it? It's like, have, have you experienced market downturn? That is a great question. Yeah, so it's actually a question we've, um, we didn't always have in our um, sort of joining process, but That's we've added great... recently yeah. because yeah, we've that. actually um, worked out that it, uh, investment experience has a huge impact on people's likely behavior. Yeah. Um, and, and people that haven't, you know, we, we have clients that are first time investors, a lot of clients that have only invested for the last five years. Now, in the last five years, we've been in a great sort of market <laughs> yeah. period. Markets have only gone up. Yes. Um, and, and so the, the perception of those clients of what um, investing is going to be like going forward is very different to a 60-year-old who yeah. you know, lost half of their wealth in 1987 the yeah. and then lost again <laughs> yeah. in 1999. Yeah. So they're a lot more seasoned. Well, uh, mate. I could literally talk to you about this forever, but uh, but it's, it's time to, uh, to, to pull it to an end. Mate, how do people find out more or, or reach out to you if, if so? Because I know you're quite active on Twitter. So, um, so yeah, they it, can find me on Twitter just yep. under my name, Chris Brikey or, yep. or Stockspot. And, yep. and um, yeah, they're welcome to, you're welcome to send me an email, just chris at stockspot.com.au. Yep. Pretty simple. Or, or visit the website as well. <laughs> Mate, it has been so awesome to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Oh, my pleasure. Super Thanks, guys. Thanks for having it. me on. Cheers.